The CGI podcast is all about successful artists and designers sharing their personal stories and experiences to inspire you to take action, learn from others, and apply the shared wisdom to your own journey as you chase your creative potential. This is the CGI podcast. This is episode 10 with illustrator and VFX entertainment artist, Matthew Borat. Two things before we begin. I can't believe we're already here, but this episode, episode 10, is the finale of season one of the CGI podcast. The podcast will resume with new episodes for season two, the exact date of which will be announced as we get closer. Probably sometime in September after everyone's done traveling and their summer schedules have returned to normal. I'd like to ask you to please join the newsletter at cgipodcast.com so we can be in touch over the break. In planning season two, I'll send out short survey in order to tailor the content to your liking. I know I can't create a great podcast without your feedback. Also, a quick reminder, when you go to cgipodcast.com to join the newsletter, you receive a workbook that I've created after learning from some of the most outstanding guests on this season. The result is a simple workbook called Learn Any Software in 30 Days. If you follow the steps and use the workbook as intended, you will see results. It's a prototype for something bigger and better to come, and I want to give it to you for free in exchange for your feedback. Just subscribe to the email list at cgipodcast.com, and it will be sent to you via email. Well, that's it for announcements, guys. So without further ado, let's dive in to season one, episode 10 of the CGI Podcast. Matt Borat is a Toronto-based illustrator and VFX environment artist who's known for his incredibly detailed, ultra-high-res images of cityscapes in various states of decay. Matt uses Moto to help him create these intricate images that have a surreal, illustrative feel to them. However, their detailed complexity offers layers of interest when viewed at different distances. Matt has worked as a matte painter and 3D modeler for both the film and TV industry and contributed to titles such as Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, Resident Evil Afterlife, The Three, the Three Musketeers, and many others. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Good to be here. So you originally studied illustration. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I went to the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. Awesome. Okay. So is that something that you've always been interested in prior to your uh, studying it at, at university? Um, actually, most of my childhood, um, I, I really wanted to be an architect. Oh, okay. And, and uh, I was kind of obsessed with, with Lego. And um, yeah, I just kind of always thought, oh, I'm just going to be an architect. And um, I, and in retrospect, I'm kind of I'm happy I didn't go that direction. I had a uh, an architecture student as a as a roommate, and he was always just locked in his room um, building models, and he called it archi torture. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, I uh, I mean, I, I guess. I, I'm still kind of into architecture, if you, um, as my work obviously indicates. But uh, no, I never actually thought about going into illustration. I'd applied to a bunch of uh, universities and and for architecture, and um, didn't get into the one that I really wanted to. And I kind of had to to suddenly go, okay, well now what am I going to do? So uh, I went up, went to Ontario College of Art and Design instead. Okay, that's interesting. So, prior to that, you were um, was it, did you end up wanting to study architecture through a? It wasn't so much of a process of elimination as it was you were actually drawn to that when you were um, still in high school. Is that right? Yeah, and, and you know, it may have been partly the influence of uh, um my parents or other adults in my life who just you know watched me building all these crazy things out of lego and and buildings and things and thought oh you'd make a good architect so and you know you hear that often enough and you think yeah okay maybe i would be uh into architecture and um yeah i'm not exactly sure what uh well i mean 
I, I'm still very much into architecture, and sometimes it seems like half my friends are architects. Um, but uh, with the path I have gone gone in, to, into, uh, I can, I I still get to design buildings, but I don't have to worry about actually making them stand. Right, that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, absolutely. You get to uh, realize those those ideas in a space that can be occupied and and all that. Um, that's cool. Did uh, so when you um, so what was that like? I mean, you 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 didn't get into the school that you wanted to, um, and I mean, was that like a big blow? Did it take a while to get over that, or was it just like a quick pivot? Or how how did you react to that? Um, you know, I think it was it had a, an especially rigorous application process, and as I was going through that process, it I realized that I don't think I was actually ready for it at that time. Um, I I guess I've always been a, a late bloomer on in many respects. Um, and I guess the reason I the the program I did want to get into it had a co-op aspect to it that that's why I wanted to go there. Um, and then for for a different school I was put on a on a waiting list and I didn't and I actually did get accepted to that but by then it was almost September and I didn't really have time to to make the arrangements and and I think at that point I just decided oh I'll just take a year off between between high school and university. Okay, so so sorry, go ahead. So in a way, it, sorry, it was almost like it was almost a on um, one level almost a relief. Mm, sure, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that I didn't Yeah. Yeah. So in between those, did you then start um I mean, was it was it a quick adjustment to then looking for alternatives uh did illustration pop into your mind right away or were you still at that point looking for a different school that would still offer an architectural program? Um, actually, yeah, I guess, uh, OCA, it was called, it was just Ontario college of art at the time when I, when I first went there, it did have, um, an environmental design program, which kind of, it wasn't like and didn't give you the accreditation of as an architect, but it dealt a lot with architecture and interior design and and I guess environment design more broadly speaking. And so when I first applied to to the school, I thought that I would uh, go that way. Um, but the first year it was just sort of a general foundational thing, and then you specialized from second year forward. And, um, I just, um, ended up going into illustration. Interesting. Instead. Okay. So was it in those first couple of years that you, you did a lot of, like you said, foundations and stuff and, um, was illustration something that kind of either came a little easier or you just enjoyed more than some of the others? Um, you know, it's, I'm actually having a hard, hard time remembering. This was back in in the early 90s and it's 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 become a little foggy right now i think i think i had been doing a little bit of illustration here and there um and it just uh and i was also i was also into sort of the more fine art side of things as well and um yeah but honestly it's 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 a little hazy in the distance <laughs> why I ended up going into illustration. And that's, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So, so you ended up going that route. You, um, you went to school and I, I think if it's all right with you, do you mind giving us kind of a, a brief overview of kind of what's happened, um, for you professionally, um, or at least maybe just the broad strokes between when you finished up college and what you're doing now. And then if you don't mind, what we'll probably do is rewind and go look at some of those, uh, a little more closely after the fact. Yeah, sure. Um, I think even before I'd qu I'd finished college, I was working. I was working at a software company um, that that made 
online casino software actually hmm. okay <laughs> i was working there i was working in the tech department there in the like tech support and um i i got to know some of the people in the art department and then the the art director stole me from the tech support department and, and then i started working there and i may end up going into a bit more detail of this and with than you want but uh, <laughs> no that's okay uh, <laughs> we, uh, we want the details so that, and i yeah so i was so i was essentially doing uh like graphic design and and interface design for this online casino software company it was called cryptologic and it was like one of the first uh companies to work in this kind of weird gray area of uh online gambling and this would have been around 96 or something um so i was doing horrible things like tr making ad banners and stuff like that and <laughs> and uh and, and so i was actually there for for uh quite a number of years doing that kind of work um even though i you know i i have zero interest in gambling and i hate casinos and visiting vegas was once was enough for me yeah <laughs> but it's, uh <laughs> so i i but in many ways it was kind of a a, a sweet gig in a lot of ways because the deadlines were very padded and <laughs> there were some perks to working there and and i as i was working there i started learning more 3d sort of stuff um and by the end i was doing like little uh little animated um 3d graphics for like slot machine symbols and, oh, okay. and that kind of thing hmm. um while at the same time, I was also starting to do like a little bit of illustration work on the side, um, and then, and then I sort of got, I got laid off from that, um, and after a brief period of unemployment, at that, that point, my my girlfriend at the time and I bought a house and gutted it and and renovating a house and um sort of through that i ended up working for a renovation contractor doing like home renovation work for about a year okay um <laughs> with kind of a you know a little bit of a zigzag there mm -hmm. and uh, um and after about a year of that there were some aspects of that work that i enjoyed and and other aspects that i definitely didn't i'm just not not physically built to haul sheets of drywall around and <laughs> certain things like that and i just realized oh this is going to destroy my body if i keep doing this kind of work um though it was an enjoyable little sort of detour and then at that time i'd been talking to a, a friend of mine who worked as a matte painter in one of the at a visual effects place in Toronto called Mr. X, and he kept saying to me, "Matt, your your skill set is perfect for matte painting, and um, you should you know let me know if you're interested. You should apply at Mr. X." And and I, I guess at the time I was kind of intimidated by the the visual effects industry I did, you know it seemed kind of like oh that's 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 serious i don't know if if i want to do that or that's interesting uh, didn't, yeah didn't have the confidence necessarily to to pursue that um but then i i remember the day when i was at the top of a very tall ladder working on one of the houses we were were renovating and i was like painting at the top of a ladder or something and and while i was on that ladder i got um i think a few days before i'd, I'd said to my friend yeah i think i think i'm ready i think i need to start doing uh, uh creative work again and so i was on this ladder and i got a call from the hr department and went in for an interview and uh and then the next thing i knew i was i was a matte painter wow. at the very bottom of the bottom of the or the 
first rung of the ladder, I guess, <laughs> uh, took a bit of a pay cut because I had no industry experience at all. And, uh, and then I was, I was there for about six, seven years. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then about two years ago, I, I think I was just a bit, I had no complaints really about the, the matte painting job I'd been doing. It was, I think, I think I just got a little bored with always having to be photo real and I was more interested in just sort of exploring other other more sort of opportunities to be more stylized and not so photo real all the time um, and so I through I sh and then I should add that throughout all this time I've also been do, had my own my own art practice where I've been um, for a long time I was just doing black and white ink and pencil drawings and I would have the occasional exhibition whether it was a group exhibition or a couple of solo exhibitions and um, and that had always been that I've been fairly successful with that actually and I think. I would have pursued that more had buying a house and gutting it and renovating it had not sort of taken over my life for a few <laughs> years. Sure. Um, so, so then when I, I, I guess around the time that I left Mr. X, I'd also ju just joined a, an artist collective in, in Toronto called Redhead Gallery which is basically an artist run gallery there's like 20 members and we we collectively run it and and part of the deal is you get you get a, a solo exhibition every every 18 months or so very cool okay um yeah so i i quit my job and decided to just focus entirely on getting a an exhibition ready and um so i did that i had i basically took the entire summer to just work full time on on creating these these giant renders which i printed for a show which i called uh hypernernia <laughs> right and uh and then since then i've basically just been working freelance and and that's gone gone really well and it, it really it took year I, it's something that i always kind of wanted to try but it, it took until not until a couple of years ago that i kind of had the the confidence to to go that way okay and uh so far so good and so since then i've been doing um a variety of things like uh i've been doing i've done a number of contracts with a with a studio here called the secret location um doing uh most recently like a a, a v working on a, a vr video game and uh that sort of th that sort of thing and also so um yeah a little bit of a little bit of illustration and and i'm also continuing to occasionally take put time aside so that I can focus on, on my own sort of personal work as well. Okay, cool. So you have, you have a, quite a bit going on now, now that you're, you are self-employed at this point, but you're using a number of the different skills and, um, mediums, I guess, that you picked up along the way. Um, and yeah, that's, that's cool. Is it, um, you said it took a while to kind of get there, but you had always wanted to, did, did it feel, uh, I mean, now I guess reflecting back, did, is it, um, I mean, how does it feel? Did, do you feel, does it feel like an accomplishment or, or do you feel the, the freedom or, or anything else that you thought you might, uh, before you actually pursued going full freelance? Yeah, it is, it is, it is gratifying. It's, I feel, um, it's 
Yeah, I mean, most of the problems that I've had with it so far are the good kinds of problems, like uh, like like having to to say no, having uh, occasionally having too many um, kind of really cool, exciting opportunities come along all at the same time, and 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 only being able to pick one or two of them. Um, so yeah, it feels really good to be there. Um, and uh, I mean, not to be too complacent about it, <laughs> you know, I might find myself suddenly, oh no, no one's calling anymore and uh, I can't get too comfortable. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good, I, yeah, I'm in a really good place because I, I mean, I have during the, the two periods where I've taken, put aside if like a one to three or four months to, to do my own thing, it definitely, those occasions have been, you know, I've, as I've done that, my bank account is whittled away and, and it's, it has caused like cash flow problems on occasion, but in, in something's always come out of it really good. Um, like for example, the, the, I just in March had another exhibition where I did the, the latest work that were like giant renders that I printed and um, that's kind of led to uh, or it seems to be about to lead to a to a, a gig where I basically will get to continue that like building that environment but for a uh, like a, a VR um, art installation um, wow that's and, you know, cool. how cool is that <laughs> yeah th no that's incredible yeah. I mean there's, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff you brought up. I mean, it sounds like a couple of cool things is that, uh, so, so you've been fortunate enough to, to be busy while you've been freelancing. And, um, and even in the times that you've set aside to pursue personal projects, they have also in turn created other opportunities, it sounds like. Yeah, it's been totally worth it in that way. Because it also, it, it it's when you do that kind of stuff and you put it out there and you do you 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 know you really focus on something that excites you and that you want to do you put it out there and, and i mean it it it's uh um yeah it, it seems like it it draws it has the potential to draw to you the kind of the kind of work that you want to do yeah and and this is this is a, a repeating or a recurring pattern that I've noticed is um, a lot of people uh, who are now working for themselves or a freelancer type uh, mention the value of personal projects and it, it makes absolute sense. Uh, it seems to me though, almost yeah. from the something that we can forget or maybe not is not as visible is that let's say you're um, a freelancer and, and somebody comes to you as a customer or a client and then they have something that they want you to do um, they may have found out that you're a person with the skill set who does freelance, but they might say, okay, can you do something like this and like this and like this, you know, um, and then it can be tough if you're trying to either emulate somebody else's work or another style or do something that you, um, wouldn't, uh, do to solve their problem. And then on yeah. the, the flip side is like, if you do have your body of work and you're, you're consistently putting out stuff that you're stoked on it seems like the clients or the customers can see those and it and and there's a good chance that that's going to speak to them and and the people who want something in a similar fashion or style will contact you and say can you do more of this and i think that's a lot more genuine uh, i think it's kind of a win-win for everybody if that's that's kind of the the pattern yeah absolutely yeah i mean it's it's been great. I've had like occasions where it's like, yeah, someone comes to me and it's like, yeah, just, yeah, that thing you did, I, I want something, just give me more of that. That's awesome. <laughs> and it's like, great. Or, and, you know, it also, it's, uh, I've, it can be a challenge, but I've managed to be able to kind of find some kind of synergy between, between paying gigs and just the things that I'm doing. Like, for example, I was when I was working um, towards uh, one of my exhibitions, and I had this sort of body of work that was growing, and, and this this sort of process that I was deep into. Um, 
uh, a musician who was looking for for some album art um, and who also was very open to to me doing whatever kind of I was into. And I said to him, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time right now, but uh, I can, you know, spin off a little some some pieces from what I'm already doing. And and, and then it's more doable for me. So um, I've had a few cases where that's been the case where I can kind of like work on multiple projects, but as long as they're kind of related to each other somehow, um, it makes it easier. I don't have to like totally switch gears to do something totally different. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, it, well, yeah. and, and I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, something that you're starting to, to hint at that, I, that I would like to hear some more of is, so, you know, it, as you mentioned, you, you got into, or, or finally took the plunge into working for yourself or becoming a full-time, uh, creative person. Um, and I mean, do you, how much of this synergy or between doing uh, stuff for you and stuff for other people or um, having a good balance between maybe personal projects or paid gigs or whatever it is, um, how much of that would you attribute to the natural, the, um, let's say, uh, kind of the maturity that comes from knowing yourself and, and, um, and, and trying a few different things out before setting into your own path, I guess, or carving your own niche. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely the case. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I feel like I'm in a good place now, but that's after, you know, years of, of frustration with trying to find the balance of, uh, you know, the, well, the, the work life balance, but also, yeah, like, I'm just, I just don't want to do any more what I don't want to do. <laughs> Whereas in the past, in the past, you, you know, you feel you've got to say yes to everything and, and, and there's value in, in, in trying all sorts of stuff. But, you know, there were times when, uh, I think there was a, there was a very brief period where I was, where I was, uh, I guess, um, I was doing freelance work for a while years ago but I was doing like a little bit of web design stuff and uh, oh, kind of whatever I could find, um, doing a whole lot of stuff that I was just not, not really into, but just, um, I think, and also related to, to that, when I was in college, for example, I, there's a, and when I was younger in general, there was a lot more of, of a, a sense of, wanting to please others or conform to the expectations of, 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 you know, what it is to be an illustrator or fine artist or whatever. And, and I think, especially in, in school, when, you know, you have, you know, some of your instructors are, and are, are um, have certain expectations and, and you, you end up doing work that's, not necessarily coming from a totally genuine place within you. And then I, I do remember specifically, it was a, a year or two after I, I, I graduated and I kind of was trying to do these, these, I was doing these paintings on plywood at the time and I just wasn't finding it in me to, to keep going with it. And I just found my, my motivation kind of draining away and just and I was kind of for a while just casting around going what what am what am I doing what am what is this for and I I basically kind of scrapped everything I was do- doing and in an effort to find find some that sort of creative juices again I kind of went back to you know what what was I doing when I was a kid mhm and what did I do when I was a kid, you know, with, with a pack of markers and a, and a drawing pad. And, and, and so I kind of tried to deliberately went back to that and threw everything out and just started drawing again and, and even just scribbling and trying to go back to the very basics of, of mark making and, 
that led to a lot of a lot of good stuff to kind of like throw out all these this accumulation of stuff that that um, weren't necessarily my own ideas. That's really cool. I, I I totally know what you're talking about because you know it seems like it's you know despite being formally trained or, or having an art education or studying something, um, yeah. To your point, you do you kind of this stuff kind of builds up and then um, it's interesting the way you described it. it. It sounds like kind of this purge led to you being able to get back into touch back in touch with something that's a lot more like you said genuine you know when you're when we're all kids we don't have external motivators um at least not to the same degree so we're not creating something for someone else we're just doing it because it uh satisfies something within us which is interesting so it's cool to revisit that with the the knowledge the years of knowledge and the, and the technical understanding of what you're doing um that's really interesting yeah so yeah i think what I, I imagine that it's a it's a common story <laughs> yeah yeah well maybe i mean or, or people get frustrated and they don't get to the point where they allow themselves to just go back to to revisit and to try to uh clear their head or mind of whatever is frustrating them and in some cases people pivot and and leave creativity because they just get frustrated and, and think, ah, i guess it's not for me um so I think it is interesting yeah. that, that that's how you reacted. And um, so so where did that lead you or where did that take you? What did you start doing after that? You you got back more into doing more like drawings with pencils and stuff or, or what? where did that take you? Yeah, that led to a whole series of drawings that, um, that were, um, I'm not sure if you've seen them there. There's a bunch of them on my website. They're like black and white drawings they're kind of architectural they many of them feature like a like a little bed in a bedroom in the center of these kind of uh almost escher like um series of connected rooms uh floating in a void um and just and just drawing in in general it led to kind of like a sort of a, a personal drawing renaissance i guess you could say yeah, that's um, that's really cool. I like how you describe them because I don't know that I could do much better. Um, and I say that because they are very unique. Like, um, you know, you have what looks like in, in one example, what looks like you're looking down upon a city of 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 buildings, and then as it moves from left to right, you kind of switch it up, and then rather than buildings being this positive volume coming out of nothing, that you know, now we're looking down into rooms and, and instead of buildings, we're, we're seeing the kind of the recessed areas. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. It's interesting for me now to look at those because uh, I've in recent years, I've very much just been working digitally in, in, in 3d and um, there have been moments when I've, when I've spent, Especially if I'm having any sort of frustrating technical problems that always crop up when you're working digitally, mm -hmm. um, saying to people, oh my God, why don't I just like, what am I doing? I need to just pick up a pencil and a ink and, and a piece of paper. Yeah. It would, life would be so much simpler. Um, and who knows, maybe I'll, I'll go through another, uh, uh, another experience of kind of throwing everything out and going back to basics again or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, and I do, I definitely do want to uh, get into all the digital stuff. I'm not ignoring that yet. I just, there's a couple other things um, I wanted to ask. And, and so with these, yeah. with these illustrations, the drawings and stuff, um, did you, was there much planning or was this literally just, uh, you, you kind of found yourself? Those are, those are very much like really elaborate doodles. Okay. Um, some of them, some of them I had kind of a vague idea and I might, I might kind of sketch them out really, really roughly, but m most of them very doodle like in the way that I did them. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you just basically would start and then lose yourself in it until you were done, huh? I mean, pretty much. Yeah. And, <laughs> That's awesome. You know, 
and at some might argue, and at times I felt like I had overdone them. I I get a bit obsess obsessive with detail, and certainly when it comes to drawing, it's very easy to to overdo something. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, yeah, and and uh, and they and they also, you know, they started with very scribbly, loose um, sketchbook type type stuff. But then as I developed the idea, they became more elaborate and more labor intensive. <laughs> and and part of the, the the digital work that I do now kind of came out of of me trying to leverage um, digital techniques to try to do similar kind of stuff that I was doing with pencil and ink and and do it digitally and be able to work faster yeah and i i definitely see that, that sort of thing I, i'm looking at one right now that almost looks like a, a slab of uh like the cement almost like a part castle part um just a large structure that's kind of decayed but um it floating in space so to speak and and it does like that that definitely looks like one of you know and, and these all do kind of uh have elements that i can see in the 3d work but um but now that that's 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 come up, uh, let's talk about that. So, so what you had and you you hinted at it earlier the some of the items that you had printed out. So you've done a few shows, and for anyone who hasn't seen this, I did. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but these are massive, massive uh, cityscapes with a ton of detail, everything from like trees to buildings to you know all sorts of all sorts of little stuff in there, and. Um, You've got two main collections. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so it's hypernia or hypernernia and yeah, and then hypnagogic or uh, Hip, hypnagogic. Hypnog yeah, hypnagogic. Okay, cool. Two very difficult to pronounce words that start with H Y. Yeah, yeah. So, do you mind kind of introducing <laughs> us to like what those are and I guess kind of how they came to be? I mean, we kind of understand this where you were coming from with the drawings, how and when and and why did you start building these? Um, well, I guess two, there's sort of two things that fed into what turned into the Hypernernia show. On the, on the one hand, I, I, was, I was looking for ways to, to, to take my drawings and, and do something like them but larger and faster. So I was doing things like I was doing hand hand drawn line work tiles that I was drawing. I have like a little Cintiq uh, mm -hmm. tablet, and I was I would make tiling tiling line work that I could layer up in 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 Moto like uh, like almost like hatching. Okay. So I did something like fifteen or twenty different hand-drawn tiles and then layering them up, multiplied on top of each other and to, as a way to kind of, which was similar to how I would draw because I would draw and I would do like a hatching and I would just mm -hmm. build build up layers and layers. So the idea was that I would, um, I would model something in 3D, not too detailed and, map on all of this uh all this texture all this line work and like wallpaper the model I with see. that stuff okay and and you yeah and use that as a base to then draw on top of so and i did a couple of images that if you, you when you look at them they don't look they look like they could be drawn in ink but they're they're done using this technique where i would i would kind of get myself 60 70 percent of the way in 3d and then take over and, and actually draw um on a cintiq digitally and take it the rest of the way so that they so what you ended up with was a hand-drawn looking thing that was um done much faster than i could do it and with in in actual ink on paper right um and that was a kind of a weird thing to do. Like I, as I was doing that, I was like 
I was kind of questioning, like, why am I doing this? Is there some kind of, am I, you know, it, it, there's like less so now, now, but there's been in the past a stigma kind of. It's like, oh, you use the computer, so, you know, uh, it's not real art kind hmm. of thing. You know what I mean? Um, and I always was kind of self-conscious about that. So hmm. as I was doing those sorts of things, I was kind of questioning, you know, why, why am I, do I, is this right to, to be making something that looks hand-drawn but, but, but isn't fully? But, you know, I, but mostly I, I, I was aware, you know, artists have always used whatever tricks they can. And how is this any different? Yeah. But, uh, so, so there was that. And then I was at the same time, I've been, I was getting really into more into 3D and in, in Modo, um, I was getting really into uh, the replicator system mm -hmm. or i mean it's that's what it's called in moto like it's other other sub packages it's more like a scattering or whatever but sure. sort of a kind of procedural way of duplicating thousands of objects um in a semi random kind of way and so i started to get more into that and and more into just letting the 3d be what it was and became less concerned with trying to mimic some kind of hand-drawn mm, look okay so and i just knew that i just wanted to, to make giant renders and print them really big and i guess part of that was after years of, of using these tools making movies and, and you know, sometimes um sometimes it was you know some of the movies I was working on, I'm like, I don't even ever want to see this movie. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it was frustrating spending hours and hours of tedious labor doing something that was going to be on screen for two seconds or less and possibly even motion blurred out of existence. Right? Who knows? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, saying that, I did work on some pretty cool projects, but uh, uh so yeah, I kept. I was always thinking, oh, these are these are such amazing tools that it would be, they should be used for other things and not just this crappy B movie I'm working on right now. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what ended? Yeah. This. So I ended up doing three eight foot by not quite four foot. Is that like the 42, 42 by ninety six inches? Yeah, that's right. And um I'm standing in front of one right now. Okay. And yeah, they're they're kind of like there's no until it was printed, I could not really see what I what I'd end up with cuz you know, I even though I've got like a fairly large monitor, you know, I, I could zoom out and look at the whole image, but it, it's 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 8 feet wide, but it's it's a full like 300 dots per inch. Right. resolution so there's there's no way to appreciate them fully without actually standing in front of the print um and uh yeah and and they were that whole technique that i sort of developed was very it was a very ex sort of exploratory process that was very like um Lots of lots of randomness, harnessing of randomness, really. Okay. Um, I mean, it sounds like there were a lot of parallels to the drawings you did. Uh, you kind of refound. You found something interesting to lose yourself in. This time, a digital tool instead of, uh, you know, say a traditional piece of media. But um, it sounds like they were they were done in kind of a similar manner. Um. Yes and no. no. Um, there's, and these pieces ended up feeling. I mean, there were aspects of drawing in them a little bit, but they were also very much like photography. Hmm. It was kind of okay. like 
I, I would have the I would set up these systems where I would have like a, a I, I got really procedural with it where I would have a noise generated height field for the ground, for example. Mm -hmm. And and then I would set up all all these uh, replicators in, in Modo that would, you know, spread a certain kind of object over the surface and um, and and often use random noise to to kind of control where things appeared as well as you know certain certain rules like certain kinds of kinds of objects can only appear on a certain slope or something like that or like a certain angle of slope and then once i had that all set up I, it was like it becomes very much like a total exploration with all sorts of unexpected things happen because i could just shuffle any number of variables and the whole thing rearranges itself into something different wow that's really cool and yeah so so it was all i was ended up kind of banking on like finding all sorts of stuff that would happen and all these weird juxtapositions would occur that was not anything that i would ever think to draw right right necessarily that's really cool that's awesome so yeah, it became really, really fun. So for every one final eight foot print, there there were maybe as many as fifty like test renders at a smaller size mm -hmm. that would kind of slowly evolve. So I would sort of go exploring in this in this random rise procedural space. And then when I would find something I would like, I would kind of like lock that part in or you know, gradually kind of refine it and refine it into where I wanted it to go. Um, and, and, and others, some images are much more, I left a lot more of the kind of randomness intact and, and others I spent more time kind of hand placing certain elements and composing it in a more deliberate way sure. than others. Yeah. Cool. So, so it really, yeah, it became a whole, a whole other thing than, than what it started as. Yeah. And that makes sense. Like I can see what you mean as far as like it being like photography. I mean, you're, you, you, you were exploring this own land that yes, you created, but you hadn't quite seen yet or didn't know or have control over all of it in some sense. It's, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you mind if I just kind of throw a lot of questions at you? about the uh, the process because I, I remember seeing some of your work a, a couple of years ago so it might have been when you were just starting this actually but um, I remember being kind of blown away yeah, and uh, there's just there's a lot to it that uh, I think people might find interesting so um, sure the first is like so were you when did you start using moto and how um, how uh, technically I mean how comfortable with it were you when you started uh this project i was pretty comfortable pretty comfortable with it by the time i started um i i'm kind of a moto native uh it, not it's really it's the first serious 3d 3d application that i started to use um i've done a, a bit here and there with with maya or light wave on occasion but uh i've got i've had moto for 10 years or 11 years now ever since version two so oh, okay so i was pretty comfortable with it so as yeah. e as each um as each version came out you you know kind of picked up a handful of the new features and and, and that way you were very familiar with it yeah i'd say okay and and yeah. and had you taken advantage of or used its replicator um, feature prior or was this something was I, I don't even remember is this was this when it was fairly new and you were kind of testing it out or I think it had been around for a few years by then okay and I had I had I took to it right away <laughs> okay cool uh, especially you know I would use it for for map painting as well if I had to do some kind of natural scenery that had a lot of um, vegetation or trees or that sort of thing, I would, 
I would use it for that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I I think I'd seen on I don't know if it was Moto or the Foundry um uh forum or something. I think so, some of your work there that looked like some very nice looking very natural looking landscapes. Was that all using the same method? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, so then if if for anyone who maybe has heard of moto but doesn't know really how uh it works um what is what's the advantage of and what's the like kind of the way you would explain it to a lay person how how replicators work and what you can achieve with them it's it's um hmm, good question how to how to put that in a nutshell um it's it's a a system for duplicating thousands or even millions of copies of an object or objects um, either across a surface or in a point cloud or um, something like that with um, all sorts, all sorts of variables that that randomize the way that they're duplicated, whether it's variations in size or rotation or um, things like that. And so, I I tend to have like in in some of these scenes uh, that I printed, I've got maybe 30, 40, 50 different replicator systems, each controlling a certain kind of object. And it's it's almost like programming a little bit, but not really. I mean, it's, it's just using the, the 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 tools and all the parameters that are available in in Moto, and it's not unique to Moto necessarily. It it, it lots of other I would even say most other three D programs have some kind of equivalent equivalent system. Um, yeah, actually, recently. I've transitioned away from doing that kind of thing in Moto, and I've started using another program called Clarice. Interesting. Okay, I've not actually even um, heard of Clarice. So, uh... it's uh, it's 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 a um, yeah, it kind of blew my mind when I started using Clarice. Uh, in fact. I still love Moto, and I use Moto for all of my modeling and and lots of and lots of things and asset creation and stuff. But when it comes to um, heavy scenes with lots of stuff, um, Clarice is totally where it's at. <laughs> okay, and then so this is uh, by the company Isotropics, or that's right. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's. It started. It's become really. Uh, it's starting to get adopted quite widely by a lot of uh, big studios now. Like, I think a lot of the uh, like a lot of the Star Wars movies recently, mm -hmm. like that planet with all the crashed star destroyers and stuff. I think that was all. That was all Clarice. And it, Clarice excels. And it's all it is is a a layout, like a lighting layout rendering application. So. Oh, that's. And it it handles. It handles an unbelievable amount of stuff. Okay, that's cool. Without breaking a sweat. Yeah. And that's that's exactly what I wanted to, I mean, um, <laughs> I wanted to kind of get there eventually. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here, uh, but, but you preemptively answered one of my questions I was going to find out or <laughs> ask about because when, so if anyone goes to the, your website and they start looking through these images, they're going to see, um, I mean, like, like just a phenomenal amount of detail, like you mentioned, and a lot of uh, anyone who does 3D work is going to know there's a lot of triangles or polygons in there. And um, de depending on your computer, that can be either impossible or just uh, a lot of work. Um, so, so it sounds like, so Clarice is a new tool that you're using to manage the, the just scale and scope of some of what you've built out. Yeah, like for example, they're they're you know using Moto to some of these scenes I had in Moto. Um, when I look back, I'm like, why did I, why did I 
<laughs> why did I put myself through so much pain? <laughs> um, because, yeah, I, I would, some of these scenes just have just vast amounts of, of, of geometry in them. And any program would be, any normal 3D program would be brought to its knees. And I had to be super strategic with the way I worked and I, there were, it was extremely frustrating at times, like waiting, um, just to be able to visualize what you're doing and in any kind of interactive way mm -hmm. became really tricky. Like I couldn't work in the scene without turning most of almost everything off. And then only at the very, very end when I would do a render would I turn everything on, make everything visible and then and then render it. And it was definitely a technical hurdle. Um, and that's one the, the thing that that makes Clarice so amazing is that I it's I'm not sure what technical voodoo it uses, but you can you can can it, it enables you to have huge amounts of things like I've had scenes with <clears throat> um, 50, 60 thousand or 50 or 60 billion polygons in them, oh for God. example. All everything visible. Wow. Like not with no bounding boxes ne necessary Holy to represent objects and, and be able to actually. Um, navigate around in your scene and see what you're doing. Um, it's, it's kind of revolutionary. Um, so, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's, um, I was literally thinking, uh, in, in experiencing some of my own frustrations on a, on a recent project I'm working on now, uh, actually for somebody else, um, not in Moto, just another program, but things were just getting a little bit heavy that I was having to go and knock down, knock back, the geometry a little bit, things like that. And um, was just thinking about yeah. like, yeah, um, with the complexity and the scale of things, like especially in films, like you mentioned, um, how complex and how much is going on in them. I was wondering kind of why there wasn't more of a focus on just handling all that. Um, but apparently there is yeah. and somebody else has answered to that. And that's really cool. Yeah, totally. So in your Clarice, yeah, uh, I'm I'm definitely going to be checking out the website after our call. But um, the a couple other questions I had was, um, uh, first off, what type of hardware did you um, was required for you to build these scenes? Was it? Do you have a pretty heavy duty computer? Um, yeah, I've got. I've got two machines right now. Um, the the one I have, the, the one that I that I <clears throat> part of that I did the uh, the moto uh, scenes in. It's just like um, actually, it started out as a Hackintosh. Okay. But now it's just when now it's just a Windows machine because the Hackintosh thing didn't work out so well for me necessarily. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just it's like a hex core. Um, so like 12 threaded, um, I, I don't even know the specs off the top of my head. I've got 64 gigs of RAM. I de definitely needed a lot of RAM. Yeah. In fact, I, at one point I, I 32 wasn't enough to, to do the renders because some of the, the renders were coming in around 28,000 pixels by mm -hmm. 13,000 pixels. And I, I couldn't even do them all in one go. I just sort of rendered them in strips. Right, and that's because Overnight. that's because of um, how Moto was rendering. Were you, were you using Moto actually as the render engine as well? For yeah, for the for the the Hyper Nernia series. Okay. That yeah, that was all Moto. So, and I had some, and some of them had a lot of displacement in them as well. Uh, so yeah, I needed okay. really needed a lot of RAM for, for that. Um, and then for the most recent work that I did, which was modeled all in moto but 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 done rendered in clarice this is the um, hypnagogic series yes okay yeah that i um I, de I had a definite deadline you know the show the exhibition opened on 
a certain date. And I had actually not used Clarice that much before. So I took the chance of attempting something fairly big with it with while also so kind of learning it at the same time. Jeez. So what ended up happening was I I underestimated how long the final render was going to take by about a factor of 3. <laughs> so I thought okay this will take this will take me about 5 days to render. So oh, man. then I can you know that'll give me 2 days to do some photoshop touch up and then then I can send it to the printer. Like it was, it was really a close call. Oh man! And then I did a couple of, yeah. And then meanwhile, I'd probably added like a hundred point lights to the scene or something ridiculous like Holy that. Holy moly! That, so the render time spiraled out of control, and I did a couple tests, and it and it it dawned on me that my six core machine was was not up to the task. And uh, unlike with 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 Moto, which had a lot of like render farm support, yeah. like cloud rendering stuff, and which I made use of a couple times. Uh, Clarice, as of a few months ago, was not supported by any render farm, so wow. you know, I had no option but to do it myself. Oh my gosh! So, and is it all um, is it CPU or GPU so, based? Uh, CPU. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's it's <clears throat> that's that I think is actually part of its voodoo is that it. Everything in Clarice is a render, even when you're just like a regular viewport. It doesn't use, it doesn't use OpenGL. It just got it's, it. Okay. It's all yeah. Um, so, so I was in a bit of a, a bind, and I had to. Uh, I knew that you could get machines that were, you know, like with huge amounts of cores and whatnot, but but such a machine new yeah. would have cost me. You know, five or six thousand dollars, sure, or something like that, which I didn't have at the time. So it was like, okay, how am I going to get this, this thing done? Yeah, I guess one option would have been to render them smaller and have much smaller pieces. But uh, I managed to sort of, in the nick of time, find a little computer store that sold uh, like a refurbished HP. Um, I don't remember the what they call them. Um, like a server, like a blade server. Zed, yeah, yeah, kind of, and yeah, like a Z. I guess they they can be set up as servers for sure. Like a, I think it's a Z eight twenty is the one I got that had. Uh, it was a sixteen core machine, so that that conveniently tripled the number of render threads I could get, which meant I could actually render this crazy image on time, and so. Yeah, now it's my my render box. Cool, very nice. That's so. That's that's. <laughs> but it was a nail biter. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean that that sounds. Yeah, that sounds stressful. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, that's cool. Just, how how did the the, I mean, visually, kind of stylistically, and with especially with the color, I think that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, that's where a lot of these yeah. this series varies from the other one. This one also. Uh, mm -hmm looks like there's some recognizable landmarks in there too. Yeah, it's it's um it started out as a uh you can you can download from the city's website. They have what's called the massing model that probably mostly architects and planners use it for um uh, whatever their purposes are. And it's just like sketch up <laughs> sketch up models of of the city in in any of the newer buildings are actually fairly high detailed um not obviously enough for my purposes but it, it it allowed me to it did all the work of scale and 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 set up a base scene for me to to elaborate on Okay, so um, are we seeing in these uh, a fair amount of Photoshop touch up with extra details and noise added in addition? Actually, no, very little. Okay, wow. Less than in the the Hypernerny one. Yeah, I, I had initially thought there would be more um, Photoshop touch up required, but I didn't. I didn't really even bother, nor did I have time to like UV things. Really, I used mostly just 
cubically mapped textures. And then if there were any awkward awkward seams to deal with, I would do, I would do a bit of touch up in Photoshop. Okay. But generally, my approach is just to I I don't even do a lot of passes in 3D. I do like a, a beauty pass and a, a Z depth pass, mm -hmm. and I and then I can use the the depth pass to just like make masks or or mm -hmm. add add extra extra haze into the distance and that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So was that one way to? I don't know if they support volumetrics in the in the Clarice program that, or uh, one that you mentioned. They do. Okay, so this was more they of do. a matter of um, control and also time. I'm sure in rendering all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, <laughs> because I was going with a much more sort of physically accurately rendered thing mm -hmm. with, a, with a lot of point lights and everything. And, and I even, I did put, I, I made some simple clouds in Houdini and, and brought them into Clarice and had some, um, yeah, volumetrics happening in there. Okay, so what do you... Which I'm sure didn't help the render time all that much. <laughs> okay, so what what do you use Houdini for? I've only just started using Houdini, just dabbling with it. I've made smoke and clouds and some some ocean wave textures okay. and that kind of thing. So is it but is I've, it mostly for like simulation stuff? Yeah. Or like like yeah. volumetrics? And, and I've only... And just using really a lot of a lot of things off the shelf, the shelf in in Houdini, and I yeah, I barely know any Houdini at all, but I knew that uh, it's definitely on my list of of things to to learn. But it's a bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure. So with this, as, as is three D in general. Exactly, exactly. It's um, oh my gosh, yeah, it's crazy. So, so um. <laughs> I really love, I mean, there, I love the differences between the, the two series that we've talked about so far, but I, I have to say, I think there, there's just, there's a different type of charm and I think it's cause it looks less alien maybe, uh, in, in the latest series that you did. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, I think, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's definitely like, are they supposed to be different, um, or representative of different seasons? Or not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. I think there's. Uh, I guess I've I've got four variations with different lighting scenarios of the of the most recent one, which which features. Um, I don't know if you know Toronto at all, but the it's basically Nathan Phillips Square, which is the okay city hall, and there's a big square there, mm -hmm. and it's. Uh, um, it's uh I I I kind of was deliberately ambiguous with it in a, a thematic way because I mean obviously it's some kind of I mean, it it gets the post apocalyptic label sure most often for understandably although but but that label kind of irks me a little bit um I think it's I just want it to be a bit more ambiguous in that it's 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 a it's it's a future where obviously some some disruptive things have happened or uh, but but I I I don't want it to be perceived necessarily as as negative yeah. entirely like there's sure. obviously still lots of signs of life there things are it's it's morphed into some different kind of society obviously um and and and, and i'm i'm happy that at least some people have come away from it thinking oh it's actually kind of a hopeful image uh yeah okay but but i i even the some of them are just lit with hdr skies okay and and uh, the first one is is just lit very in a very staged way with just big point lights and things. Um, I guess you it kind of looks like nighttime, but when I was working on it, I had I wasn't even necessarily thinking in terms of night and day. 
I was just being very kind of almost theatrical mm -hmm. with the lighting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like, I mean, they each have their own, like you said, different, different, um, Lighting scenarios, different, I'd Mood. say, yeah, yeah, and like color temperature too, it's it's all, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think mood is good because I think some of them look maybe more energetic than others, others look more restful maybe, but, um, but yeah, so, so. Yeah, that's the really fun thing with 3D is to be able to, to just relight something and get an entirely different feel yeah. and, and to be able to iterate something so, so easily. That's right. Whereas like drawing or painting or something, that's like you start from s the beginning again and uh, mm -hmm. do it again. Um, um, the way that I describe the technique, because obviously, you know, I've got when I have these things printed and hanging in, a, in an art gallery, um, a lot of people come to see them that that haven't any idea how yeah. I make them. Right. And it's it's interesting because they're they're confused often. They're like, what is it? Is it a painting? Is it a photograph? Exactly. I don't understand. What is it? <laughs> yeah, no, I <laughs> can see people, that. Yeah, yeah. So the way that I ended up describing it the most often um, is that I'm building a virtual diorama, and I'm modeling it and and making this really intricate diorama and then I light it and I photograph it is kind of how I try to break it down. Yeah, that makes, I think that's, that's a perfect analogy for somebody who uh, has not any experience with any of these tools, but I think that, that definitely, that definitely does it. Um, when you're, when you're creating these, I, I just, I was curious too, is, um, is there uh like, is there any particular the theme or idea or statement that um, is behind or maybe these are somewhat representative of, or is it more of an aesthetic exercise in which you just designed and created what you wanted? <laughs> There's definitely that. But when it comes to themes, I think... Um, I, on one level, it, they might be sort of a response to the urban environment. I grew up in the country, mm -hmm. and, you know, I grew up playing around a beaver pond and on the back 40 sort of thing. Sure. And, and I was pretty lucky in that way. Um, but I've lived most of my life in this giant city and I, I so I think these images are kind of a response to like a lot of the urban environment um, particularly that sort of as it's been built over the since World War II really I just find really just really sterile and bland and uninspiring and I think these images that I that feature urban environments are definitely kind of a response to that like maybe on one level it's 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 i'm taking out some frustration sure <laughs> and uh so it, it makes me happy when when somebody sees um uh, sees the image and go oh it looks more fun it looks it looks better than it does now <laughs> <laughs> even though it's half in ruins sure. and, and um I've kind of, yeah, brought nature's revenge in a way. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I like that. That's that's very cool. And I've always just been, I've just had a fascination with ruins all my life, and it's just fun to imagine mm -hmm. that's cool. new things in ruins. Yeah. So what's the... Um... So are you currently working on something that are you working on another personal project yet or um or are you are you full time working on on some other clients projects at the moment? I was just working on a, a VR video game called Blasters of the Universe. Okay. <laughs> Which is that sounds like, a, like it would appeal uh, to my 8-year-old self. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's like a basically a 
I guess they call it a bullet hell game hmm. where uh, you're just standing in one spot and there's lots of shooting. And uh, <laughs> that was really fun. Like, so I was doing like a, a lot of just environment modeling and texturing for that. Um, yeah, it was really fun. I'm not really a big video game player myself. Mm-hmm. Um, partly because I tend to get really addicted to games like SimCity or that sort of stuff. Right. And so I just avoid them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just uh, I was working on that recently. And I've also got this other kind of independent project with um, with a couple of collaborators that we've been working on for about a year that involves doing um, uh, VR still renders, at least so far they've been still renders, of historic scenes in in the city. Um, this this July first, it's uh, Canada's 150th birthday. Wow! So it's the the big Canada 150 celebrations are going to be happening, and and there's there's um, a lot of stuff going on to to celebrate that. So we're doing um, two VR scenes of of the city in 1867. Wow. Um, yeah. That's cool. So I'm kind of madly working on, on those. So we're, what we're doing is we're having, we're, we're going to the locations and shooting a, 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 uh, a 360 photograph of the present day. And, and then I'm doing, um, 3d rendered. 1867 views and are those based um, off one of the view sorry go ahead one of the views is is from out in the in the harbor and so yesterday morning we were out um out in a in a little motorboat out in the harbor with our camera rig and taking photographs out there which is kind of fun that's cool uh, are you do you have like historical photos that you're basing your work off of uh yeah definitely there's definitely a huge amount of research and it's really cool that the city the city archives have something like ninety thousand uh photos scanned and wow. searchable on 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 the internet so and i i'm a bit of a uh heritage buff in that way so i've i've been into that kind of thing for years which is partly what led to this project um and uh yeah so yeah definitely a lot of a lot of research and even uh my 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 map painting career it's sort of one thing that i i came to kind of focus on or i was kind of the go-to guy when it came to doing like period hmm. period cool. reconstruction of 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 a city or or that kind of thing so yeah so so i am doing i'm using Sorry? No, 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 go ahead. So yeah, I'm using Clarice for that. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool uh, kind of confluence of a, of a variety of interests of mine all coming together into one project. That's, that's nice. The, um, so this is something that's going to be unveiled for the celebration, the, the 150 birthday. And this is something that other people yeah. will be able to experience. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They'll be they'll be online, and uh, they'll be. Um, I think there's like uh, the city has a a van that's going to be touring around to all these different festivals and events around the city all summer, and, and I, they'll. I think they'll they're going to have headsets, and um, yeah. We've had very little time to do it. Oh man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was gonna say uh, that's coming up pretty uh, soon, huh? I mean, that's a couple weeks away. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's another client, which is um, the the there's a like an old uh, distillery in the city that's that's a, a, a historic site, and we're doing a view in the distillery as well. That that might be 
later in the summer that that one gets released. Okay, so is is VR something? Uh, I know you mentioned that you'd done some of it before, but um, is it becoming a good amount of the work that you're doing? It seems like it might be. Yeah, it has. It totally has, and not necessarily out of out of it just it just everything just started coming up VR about a year ago. It's really it's interesting. Um, uh, shortly after I did the the uh, one of my shows that they Moto came out with a you know a stereo VR camera, mm-hmm. and one of the first things I did was drop a VR camera into the middle of of my my worlds that I'd made and and did some VR renders, but I didn't have a headset of my own, so <laughs> I I sent them to to the guy guys at uh, the secret location who were who i'd worked with before because i knew they were doing a lot of vr stuff and they were like oh get in here you got to see this so <laughs> yeah it was really wild really wild to 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 spend so much time and then on this crazy world that i was just used to seeing from a, a long camera up in the sky mm-hmm. and suddenly be down in in place was it's pretty wild. Well, I'm sure too. Um, and like just looking around and seeing certain buildings and places, you know, occluded by others, and and uh, obviously VR in and of itself is a pretty immersive experience. But I mean, with with your worlds and cities being how built, how large they are, I think if you get in there, mm-hmm. um, you would just see these towering over you. And I think that that would be just such a phenomenally different feeling or experience. Yeah, for sure. Like you could probably do, and I don't know if you, but like animating, you know, people have drones and people are grabbing lots of aerial footage of, of urban environments and stuff, but like animating a camera, uh, fly through of one of your, uh, environments, I, I imagine would be pretty cool. Yes, for sure. And the only reason I haven't done it yet is because, um, just of the, the render times involved. <laughs> I need my own render farm. Yep, absolutely understood. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, are, are all these all these VR related jobs that came up? These are all people who reached out to you. Um. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the secret location, they've been definitely like um, pioneering VR storytelling kind of kind of stuff now. Ever since VR kind of made its resurgence um and uh yeah they've done a lot of cool work um and i i had done some effects work for them before done some like environment work and so um yeah it just it just seems like i mean i don't know i was having a we were talking some friends and I last night about vr and whether it's going to be is it just a fad mm-hmm, right or is it here to stay uh, you know what it, it's it's definitely an entirely new medium when it comes to you know you can't you, it's got its own set of rules definitely that it's it's like the early days of television or something where where you know you can't be too narrative and when you have a 360 view you can't force <laughs> someone to look at something in particular like it's a yeah it's a very different kind of thing yeah it's definitely and i've thought about uh sorry no uh, i was just gonna say it's it's that that that's happened that conversation is a common one uh people just wondering if vr is is uh, here to stay and if it's um kind of when and how it's going to become really embedded uh i'm just mentioning that that yeah that you brought that up i'm like yeah I, i've heard that a lot and I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what it's going to take before people uh, just take that as a fact, you know, is it just going to be time or is it going to be adoption in different ways or I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about, uh, Brooklyn. I'm sure it's just the same there, but I mean, there's a VR arcade starting to pop up all over the city now. Wow. <laughs> um, I don't get out much, yeah. honestly. I, and... it's, it's terrible to say, but, um, <laughs> uh, I feel like I don't, but, but there probably is. Yes. I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. 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 And I guess, I mean, at the moment that the, the technology is still a little bit clunky, um, mm-hmm. there's cables to trip over and things like that. But I mean, yeah, it's only going to get more elegant as 
as time goes on, I guess. Is that is that is that the type of work that you would like to do more of? Um, yeah, I think I think it fits with what I do. Like I'm I'm creating these vast worlds that that are like ripe for exploring and what better way <laughs> than to uh go in in vr unfortunately there's i mean when you're dealing with a scene with you know 100 billion polygons in it you can't set that up in real time sure at least not yet anyway right yes uh so um at one of the pro projects that 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 i will probably be working on in the next and then in the next year will actually involve sort of translating uh, one of my scenes and uh, into something that's more interactive. Like I'm excited about like light field technology and, and stuff that will allow you to, to do pre-rendered, like pre-rendered VR renders that, that will allow for a certain range of, of movement. Sure. Um, whether it's like, a uh, three foot cubed sp space where you can move your head around in because when you're just doing a, a still render in VR, I mean, it's kind of, it's cool, but you know, it's, you know, if you, if you move your head around, it can actually make you feel a little bit queasy because there's no corresponding movement in the environment. And sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing with VR. It's easy to make you th sick <laughs> if you don't do it right. Yeah, I've heard that. I've only had limited experience with some some of the uh, some of the tools. I don't know, um, tilt brush or something like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's it's. I know. Um, I mean, I work for um, Luxion, who makes Keyshot, and we are adding VR support um, in a number of different ways. And that's in, in our newer next release, which is which is very much on the brink of release. So um, I'll, I'll be interested to uh, personally play with that and, and see where, where people go with that as well. Um, yeah. Well, that's cool. The coolest thing I've ever done in VR is the thing that impressed me the most was Google Earth VR. You know what? There, somebody was demoing that at an event I was at in Boston last month, and it was phenomenally cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because the, I mean, the the 3D uh, cities they've got in, in Google Earth are pretty incredible. So to be, to be like a 300 foot tall giant standing in the middle of Central Park was pretty crazy. Yeah, that that's really wild. Um, yeah, I don't, I. Yeah, it's impressive. It, and and what I think is cool is like you know Google Earth uh, being around quite a bit longer before the hardware to uh offer that experience um i don't think anyone could have known or you know most people didn't know or expected to go there but it's cool that having something that's been built over the past i don't know how long 10 or 15 years or whatever is what's enabling yeah them to make the most or offer something pretty gargantuan through this new medium mm -hmm. rather than having to like yeah who knows yeah, it's like instead of uh, a company saying, okay, now we have this hardware and now we have to go make this video game with the huge world, they have this world that's been created yeah. long ago and then it's just, you know, a matter of adapting it for the, the new medium, I guess. Yeah. Uh, cool. So yeah. with, uh, with all of the work that you've done uh, ever since switching to freelance, leaving your previous job, You've made time to do a couple of exhibitions, and you've created some some cool worlds. Um, have these led to? Have these in this work in particular led to more like it? Uh, I guess like uh, like paid jobs too. I mean, not just uh, personal exploration. Yes. Yeah. It totally has. Cool. So <laughs> I've lucked out in that way. <laughs> That's awesome. So you're gonna. So we're going to see more of this work from you, hopefully, here in the near future. Um, in in yeah. in uh, on that note, are there any uh, before we wrap up? Are there any kind of um, 
over the past two years, are there any lessons you've learned that you um, would share for uh, to somebody who might be ready to take the plunge, become become their own entity, uh, and offer their services and skills as a creative? Um, I guess I would only really reiterate kind of what we touched on earlier in that if you can find something that the thing that excites you most to do and hone in on that and, and, um, find your thing and get good at it. And then, and even, you know, if you make some sacrifices for a time to develop those things. If you have to, then it might pay off. <laughs> so, yeah, no, yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it has apparently for you and I think it's really cool. Um, I, uh, is, is there any one that you've done so far that's been a personal favorite of yours that, that you enjoy maybe a little more than the rest or had something a little unique about it that made you enjoy it more than expected? You mean of my recent personal projects? Yeah, exactly. Um, um, it's it's kind of hard to pick favorites. Um, I think the the work I did for my Hypernernia show is something I kind of want to get back to. I mean, it's fun to to make work that involves a, a, a specific recognizable place. Um, it, it lends it a lot of impact, but um, it was also fun to, to just kind of sort of surf the, the random procedural aspect of, of, the, of the earlier work. And I, I, I might, I think when I have some time, I, I'm going to pick that thread up again. Cool. And, yeah, that uh, that would be really awesome. Play around. Yeah, it's definitely like a kind of bouncing back and forth between different things. Is feels like a healthy thing to do. Yeah. Um. I I think in something could be super fun for a while, but then just gets boring if you don't change it up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's good that you have both to go back and forth between. Um, and I assume you're you're working from home. You do all this work from your your home. Um, some of it, uh, some of the contracts have involved going into office spaces. Okay. Um, which is cool too. But uh, yeah, working at home has its pros and cons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understood. It's, uh, can get a little lonely on occasion, <laughs> but. Uh, um, yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, I really appreciate you taking us through uh, your your story. I mean, it's it's interesting how you started in in the idea of uh, pursuing architecture, and even though you didn't realize it become a uh, modern, I don't know, or say traditional architect, you did eventually by using the tools that you have now uh, between the various programs you use. And I, I think, you know, I think that <clears throat> all the different worlds and the different images that you've got on your website really show a pretty fantastic um, amount of creativity that, um, you know, I'm almost glad that you didn't become a, a traditional architect because then these crazy worlds that we see here couldn't have been realized. <laughs> so it definitely seems yeah. like it's a blessing in disguise. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know it's funny. I was thinking the other day uh, of sort of the the arc of my my career, and and uh, one of one of the big prints I did. It's uh, it's kind of a, like a one of the ones sort of like this cityscape with all these towers and things. And I remembered back when I had my my first computer it was a Commodore sixty four. And just as a kid playing around on this this thing, I would, I guess it was at the 
now it would almost seem like pixel popping kind of art because <laughs> you know you, i think the screen resolution was something like 320 by 200 something pixels or something wow like and i and i remember making this little little image in whatever paint program i had on this this computer that that was basically the same thing like all of these towers and buildings and things and, and it, it struck me like oh my god i'm just i'm doing exactly what i was doing when i was a little kid on this computer and just and, at like an yeah. in, infinitely greater resolution and fidelity <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah just ten thousand times larger that's really cool um so is there <laughs> is there anything that you're looking forward to or any type of projects you'd like to work on in the next I don't know, five years or so that you're hoping to get to at some point? Um, not, I mean, I do, I have another exhibition scheduled for probably later in 2018. And at some point I'm going to have to say, okay, what am I going to do for that? Um, definitely helps motivate me to have a deadline. Um, but Less specifically, one thing that I've started to do more recently um, is collaborate. Yeah. Okay. More with with the people, and and I, it's definitely something that, uh, regardless of what exactly I'm doing, I I want to do more collaborations. Like for example, the 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 hypnagogic city image that I did, um, I actually invited a friend who who also uses moto um and just out of, out of a conversation we were having she was talking about how she's really into like shanty town architecture and stuff oh, yeah. and i'm like oh i i need some shanty towns for the tops <laughs> of some of my buildings that's awesome and, and so she actually contributed some of some of the models to that and and that was really fun so i had this idea wouldn't it be neat to like to, to pool the like I don't know, ten or more modelers to like model bits of something, and then I can take it and put it all together into a big scene or something fun like that. That is really cool. Uh, That's awesome. I've always been a, very much a kind of a lone wolf, kind of with my work, and uh, that's uh, yeah. I think that's something I'd like to change a little bit and collaborate more that's awesome that's awesome i i can't wait to see what uh this next year brings uh whether it's work that you produce for your show or or any other future collaborations um for anybody who wants to connect with you or see your work um uh, I'll link up a few items in the show notes. Definitely, I know uh, for anyone who's curious about some of how you've built these, I know that you've documented some of that on Vimeo. Um, but outside of that, what's the best uh, place for people to go to either see your work or get in touch with you? My website. Okay. Just, yeah. So matthewborit.com. That's probably the best way. I'll link that up as well. Yeah. And, and that has links links to my Instagram and Vimeo and perfect that kind of thing. Okay, great. I'll link that up. Yeah. And then um, I guess if anyone's in the area, uh, where's where's Redhead Gallery so they can come visit? It's uh, in the 401 Richmond building at, at Richmond and Spadina downtown. Cool. So hopefully somebody, so hopefully we have somebody listening who's local who might hear this and peek their head in and, and check it out. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking some time to share your story. Uh, I've enjoyed your work for a number of years and just was always kind of like my mind was blown, just like kind of what you said about the people who sometimes walk into the gallery and are just like, what is it? How is it made? It's, you know, <laughs> I, I had that experience. I was, cause I'm like, you know, coming from a industrial design background, you know, where at like, I was proud to model, I don't know, like a potato peeler or something ridiculous. And then I see something like this. I'm like, there's no way somebody made that in 3D. It just seems too vast. And um, of course, I was wrong. And then ever since I realized that, I was like, man, I need to, I want to find out more. So thanks for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure.
Well, I hope you enjoyed the final episode of season one with Matt Borat. Head on over to cgipodcast.com slash episode slash 10 to get the full show notes from this episode. And finally, since this is the uh, last episode between season one and season two, if I can ask you to do me a big favor, head on over to iTunes and leave a comment or, or a, a review, I guess. Um, I, I have to say that I definitely underestimated the amount of work that it would take to produce this podcast, but I'm glad I committed to it. Um, it's been roughly six months of work during evenings and weekends, and I hope it's been worth it for all of you as listeners. I definitely enjoyed producing it myself. Uh, if you have recommendations or suggestions of what you'd like to see in the podcast, how I can improve it, maybe what you'd like to hear for season two, maybe who you want to hear from, uh, please send an email to the CGI podcast at gmail.com, and I will get back in touch with you. All right, everybody, I'll be back for season two. Until next time, this is Will Gibbons signing off.